Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... And there's another thing that was kind of funny to me in the documentary uh, about going into the water when it was really cold and wearing a Speedo. (laughs) Something about shrinkage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was real, man. That was real. But you took care of that. The water is like 60 degrees, and it's cold. It's it's not, it's freezing, it's, everything's cold. And, you know, I'm standing there with a Speedo and, like, trying to do the scene, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is just not going to work. So I was like, all right, just give me five minutes here, right? And then I just grab a towel or one of these warming jackets and just kind of go in the corner on the boat and just kind of put a little teepee around myself and do a little self-fluffing and... Sure enough, you get some circulation back, and like I said in the documentary, you get to represent yourself a lot better. But it does talk about how Baywatch, in general, influenced pop culture in the 90s. and you All know, over the world. Yeah, all over the world, and how literally a billion, 1.1 billion people were tuning in weekly, and at the time, there were only 5.6 billion people on the planet. So, that's a lot of people. Is it true? Tommy Lee didn't particularly care for you. Pam and I were shooting a kissing scene at the ocean's edge and the extra one of them had shot it and Tommy was sitting at home that night and basically the the tagline was like meet Pamela's new boyfriend this is like my introduction to my character and here they are making out on the on the shore Baywatch and he went ballistic and the next day I'm walking down to the set and I'm walking past her trailer and I just hear all this like it sounded like someone was in there with that construction crew demolit like and he was in there just you know renovating her trailer with like his fists. California is famous for many things movies, TV, stars and of course our beaches and tiny red bathing suits. There was one show made it a requirement to run on the beaches, and not just run, but run in slow motion, with maybe a little bounce along the way. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest from the cast of the most popular show in TV history, David Chokichi from the global hit Baywatch. If you'd like to be more involved with us at Still Here Hollywood, you definitely can. Just visit patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. You can support us for as little as $3 a month. Then you can see who our upcoming guests will be and submit questions for them. You can even tell us what stars you want us to have on as guests. You'll also get exclusive behind-the-scenes info, pics, video, and more. Again, that's patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. Hi, David. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank Uh, you for having me. Oh, sure. Um, we want to know what's happened to you over the years. What have you been doing lately? Um, well, a little bit of everything. Um, you know, life has been really good. I've, um, I have a daughter who's 12, about to turn 13. She actually just started in seventh grade. And, um, I have, uh, my wife has always been, um, a corporate executive at a fashion brand, which required a lot of travel. Um, so I, I pretty much raised her kind of up until, um, I don't even know, but she left the company about a year ago. And so for the majority of the time, it was like her and I, um, and then now that my wife's formed a uh, consulting company, it's, she has more, it's more like a family unit again, which is at first it was a little bit like jarring because I'm like, whoa, we're used to doing it our way. Now you're home. What's going on? But um it's been it's been uh actually just it's absolute blessing because you know for a daughter to have her mom around especially as my daughter's going through that you know entering pure she's in puberty and good luck with that yeah i know so at least she has you know my my wife's around she can talk about like female issues with her if she's not comfortable talking about with me even though i'm like like the coolest dad <laughs> i feel like i'm like an open book and things have been good you know um we're we've been doing this baywatch documentary um after baywatch moment in the sun which is streaming on hulu and um we started that in 2019 and then covid hit and um nicole Eggert and this guy matt felker collaborated and then nicole kind of had some or she kind of just drifted a little bit and Matt ran with it and put his own money into it and put a lot of his own money into it and just 
it kept evolving and he just kind of kept going with it. And I mean, we were shooting stuff up until probably three months ago and it released in August on August 28th. Like, um, so they were continually adding little pieces and I kept saying yes to like everything because it was a lot of it was ocean related and fun stuff. Um, so that, that's been, it's been a really cool resurgence because, um, ABC News Studio put a ton, like a million dollars into marketing or something. And we went to the TCAs in Pasadena in July, like eight of us cast members and a bunch of them I haven't seen in years. And um, it was it was amazing. Usually, I mean, you've been there, right, to the TCAs. And usually it's like uh, they're vicious. And out of the entire day, it was all positivity except one woman went for one jugular moment and she got stuffed. And it was awesome to see her get stuffed because she was so hoping to just like hook this actress on this topic and she got shut down and it was beautiful. But um, there's been so much press that's come out about it and and really positive press, you know, it, it, because I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but it's a... Uh, it, it it's the, each episode is a little bit different, but it does talk about how Baywatch in general influenced pop culture in the nineties and you all know, over the world. Yeah. All over the world. And how literally a billion, 1.1 billion people were tuning in weekly. And at the time there were only 5.6 billion people on the planet. So that's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. I remember the first time I covered the Oscars, I think the, uh, the catchphrase was a billion people are watching. <laughs> You top that all every week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, is it true Tommy Lee didn't particularly care for you? <laughs> yeah, Tommy. What's up, dude? <laughs> well, you know, there was um there was some there was an incident. So back in the day when we were shooting the show, you know, they could only police tape off so much area uh, when we shot at Santa Monica at Will Rogers uh, State Beach. Right. And, and that, that was back in the day when there was like extra and inside edition and those camera crews would roll up and, you know, they'd just stand behind the police line and they could zoom in and shoot. If we're shooting and we're shooting, Pam and I were shooting a kissing scene at the ocean's edge and the extra one of them had shot it and Tommy was sitting at home that night and basically the, the tagline was like, meet Pamela's new boyfriend. This is like my introduction to my character. And here they are making out on the, on the shore of Baywatch. And he went ballistic. And the next day I'm walking down to the set and I'm walking past her trailer and I just hear all this, like, it sounded like someone was in there with that construction crew demol it. Like, and he was in there just, you know, renovating her trailer with like his fists. He was not happy and he had threatened the producers and he basically, you know, said, if you write another kissing scene with David Chokichi, I'm going to do this to you. And it uh, unfortunately put a lot of stress on Pam and, and I saw it and I was really like, I, I, I was just a, being a straight up friend to her. I was, there was no ulterior motive for me. I was like, and, and that's the thing that, bum me out it's like I, I was never looking to like press this relationship because the reason we work so well Pam and I was more like because we were like we're very kindred spirits but almost like not brother and sister but we just were very self-deprecating we'd love to like we were just fun together you know but we weren't like looking to ever like hook take, up yeah no I wasn't I, I wasn't that kind of guy and I definitely wouldn't do that to a guy, a woman who's married, and especially a woman who's married to Tommy Lee. Well, you know, she's also, I gotta tell you, uh, one year she was at the Cannes Film Festival promoting her movie, um, Barbed Wire, mm -hmm. I think it was called. Yeah. Hordes of people would just surround her when she was on the beach, yeah. when she was on the pier. There was no getting away from it. Yeah. Uh, and I felt kind of bad for her. But, yeah. You know. I mean, when we were shooting the show, they would be hiding like, they would like crawl under the grip trucks and hide there just trying to get a shot of her with a, like without makeup or doing something. It, it was insane. Like the, the, the paparazzi pressure and then this other pressure. And then the crazy thing is we ended up going out to dinner a couple months later. It was like Pam and Tommy, Yasmin, 
uh, myself, a buddy of mine, and I forget who Yasmin was with at the time, but a small group of us went out to dinner. We ended up like partying together. And Tommy and my buddy and I go up and we're having like shots together. And he was like the coolest dude in the world. And it was like nothing had ever happened. And I'm like, uh, so I, I, I don't know. I was like, you know, I get it. I get it. in the moment. He was probably just like, you know, this is, but you got to realize, it, you know, and, and the producer was like, we, we can't just stop writing this. This is what the show is about. And it's, it's not like a movie. It never goes beyond kissing. You know, it's, it's like, come on, man, she's an actress and that's part of the deal, you know. Well, and she's also a dude magnet. She is a dude magnet, and she's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. And there's another thing that was kind of funny to me in the documentary uh, about going into the water when it was really cold and wearing a Speedo. <laughs> yeah. Something about shrinkage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was real, man. That was real. But you took care of that. I took care of it. I, I discovered, I was, I was very smart, like... Um, you know, we, we would shoot these scenes. So because of my character was, a, was an Olympic hopeful, a lot of times they'd put me in a Speedo. It'd be 6 in the morning or 6.30 in the morning in June, and we're, whatever, a mile offshore. It's foggy. The water's like 60 degrees, and it's cold. It's, it's not – it's freezing. It's, everything's cold. And, you know, I'm in there for an hour at least while they're just doing, like, you know, all these shots with the follow along boat. And then you have to get out of the water into a boat and do a scene with, it would be Alexander Paul, who's like kind of my swim coach. And, um, and you know, I'm standing there with a speedo and like trying to do the scene. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is just not going to work. Like there's just like, my, my balls are up in my stomach and you know, there's just, so I was like, all right, just give me five minutes here, right? And then I just grab a towel or one of these warming jackets and just kind of go in the corner on the boat and just kind of put a little teepee around myself and do a little self-fluffing. And sure enough, you get some circulation back. And like I said in the documentary, you get to represent yourself a lot better. <laughs> Good to go. Yeah, baby. I had a friend who used to say uh, when he was troubled by shrinkage, he would say, um, any smaller, I'll have a vagina, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's not sexist. Yeah. It's not meant to be. Anyway, um, what about Yasmin? You just uh, mentioned her. Yeah. How's she doing? I haven't been. I Some people are in touch with her. I know um, I know she's doing fantastic. She Her life, I think, is fa she's married and super happy. And um, I know she's sober and doing great. Um they, you know, they tried to reach out to her to see if she would do the documentary, but she, she really didn't want to go back into the public spotlight, really at all. So um, she basically just declined, um, which is kind of too bad. She was such a huge part of the show, and and she's such an amazing human being. And I know she's like everybody. I mean, what you realize. I think, at, and not just in the entertainment business, but in life in general, if you live long enough, you're going to go through shit. You're going to go through some, like high, lots of highs, but there's also going to be lots of lows. And some of those lows can be all kinds of various things that can either last a long time and, and it's up to you. You got to find ways to battle your way out. Just like I battled my way out with this whole thing with my leg and my, how my basically darkness. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I don't falter for anything, you know, I, I, it's just people get, you know, they fall in with the wrong crowd. And then the next thing you know, you don't, you can't see your way out of it, you know? And, um, you know, I've had times in my life when, when I was probably not taking care of myself that well. And, you know, I was single and we would, you know, be like, you know, when you're an actor and if you're not working, it's like, hey, it's Tuesday night. You want to go shoot pool and we're all drinking beers and shooting pool. And then you go look to go do something else. And it's but it's Tuesday night. And most people are in bed. And like um, then, you know, once you especially once I had a daughter and a child and I was like the, all that stopped and I, I don't do anything anymore. I, I I'm I just I I. I take care of myself. I, I'm like in the fitness and getting up super early. We'll be back for more in a moment. 
Do you think Baywatch hindered your career at all? I think, you know, initially when it hindered all of our careers, there was a certain stigma against all of us. We were shooting a, a medium of entertainment. It, we never said we were doing Shakespeare on the beach. We were doing Baywatch. Was it great really getting together with everybody again? How long had it been? I mean, a, a, a bunch of us see each other on pretty much on the regular. Um, you know, Hasselhoff kind of has, is spending more time over in Europe because he's married to uh, uh, his wife is from Wales, I believe. Um, so he, I, I used to see him a lot and we used to plan these really cool, we're both like adrenaline guys. We're, we're still planning on doing this diving trip off South Africa and hopefully that happens. Um, Watch out for sharks. Th that's what we're hoping to go see. And, and there's this um, really cool thing. It's, uh, what's it called? Um, I can't remember, but it's a, it's like a big like run with all these fish migrate and you get in the water with them and it's like supposedly like just amazing. Um, but I see like Alexander Paul and Jason Simmons and Jeremy Jackson and um, Pam, we don't see that much. She used to live in Malibu and now she's back up in Vancouver Island, I'm pretty sure. And Yeah, I was watching a, a documentary with her yeah. at her new home, Yeah, which is way off the beaten track. Yeah. I guess you get enough of that publicity stuff. Yeah, and you go back to nature, which yeah. in nature, as I've learned recently, can be super healing. Um, so I, I, I don't blame her, you know. It's probably a lot of peace and a lot of just happiness, you know. Um, but we, we've, we've all stayed in relatively close touch because there's, you know, been various reunions and... You know, there's also a potential reboot happening at Fox, which we'll see if happens. But um, it's been fun. The, the The documentary, the coolest part was not not forcing us, but we just by proximity of, of like they would double up interviews and would see each other. And um, that part was amazing. And um, I got to see like Mike Newman. Do you remember Mike from the show at all? Knew me. Knew me. He was the 6'5" like Iron Man, just beast. And he unfortunately is going through, you know, pretty debilitating Parkinson's. Oh. And, um, you know, to see that, but that, that's that been heartbreaking because uh, he was the one when I, before I even got on the show, and I think E.T. covered it, I have like the clip and it's so funny. Like I'm so young and he's, the water's freezing and it's great down at Santa Monica. And he's like, all right, man, this is what you got to do. You got to like take the can, do this, run in, dive over the waves, dolphin. And, you know, I was like, just, yeah, let's go. And I did it. And, but he was the guy who like did all the training for me to lead up to shooting. And, um, and he was just awesome. And anytime he and I, because I grew up on the East coast in Massachusetts on the water and my mom was a sailor. So she had us literally sailing at age five on, and she was like, no bullshit. Like, we were fortunate enough, we lived right on the water in a harbor, but we would have to sail from our, like where our dock was, down to the race, do the race and sail home. And like sometimes the races were at six in the morning and it's blowing like 20 knots and the boat's like ready to flip. And she's like, get in that boat and get down. I don't care. There's no excuses. <laughs> like you're doing that race. And, you know, it built character. And, um, I ended up really going, I, I ran with that a lot. I ended up teaching sailing. I competed. Um, I raced 420s, which are a two-man boat, which are really fast. Went to the um, Junior Nationals in those multiple times. I raced windsurfers, triangle racing, and went to the Junior Olympics in that. Um, so I knew how to drive boats really well. I was a certified scuba diver. I knew CPR. I was on a swim team. Um, all these skills when I came to an audition time for Baywatch and, and part of the audition was a swim test. Um, they just, they were like, wow, this is the guy, you know, and my character happened to be also an Olympic hopeful swimmer. So you had to be an actor who could also swim and look legit. Um, but getting back to my point, like, so I had the skills to be able to drive like the Scarab, which is like the big yellow long speedboat, which is, you know, it goes really fast, but it's very hard to maneuver in close. And so they would let me or knew me drive it like up against like the Ve the Venice Pier. They'd be like, go full speed and then, you know, kind of bank it as close as you can. And they would let any time there was a rescue and it was knew me and I, it was like I knew it was going to be a fun day because 
he's so skilled and I trusted him a million percent and I knew he would look badass and we were just like kick ass all day. If it was me and someone who wasn't so great in the water or with the jet skis, you know, cause even like riding a, a jet ski, if the camera is right there and you know, they're saying like, you know, pull this, the ski up and turn it right away and then deliver your lines here. It's, it's, you know, people who have never ridden a jet ski, it's very difficult to do. Like, and I, I could do it on a dime, just like precision and other it's people. It's a gift. Yeah. So those skills add up. And, and, and the, so once they saw the skill level set that I had, they're like, oh, my God, we can write tons of shit for this guy. Like action, like beyond belief, because he can do it all and we don't need a stunt double. And so the it was kind of this, you know, the more skills you had, the more fit you were, the more you worked and with your acting coach, which I did every night and I trained in the gym every night. Like I just gr- I just was in this mentality of discipline and – they would put you in more episodes. You became more popular. Um, you made more money. And, you know, Baywatch was a big believer. They did not want to pay. They didn't pay you well. They paid Hasloff and Pamela very well, but they didn't pay anyone else. But they believed they could, you could make your money off the show doing appearances or whatever. And, and that was true. But you had to you had to pop off the you had to pop out of the cast in order to kind of be that and luckily i did and 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 my I'd work say ethic so. pop, my work ethic paid off yeah you said you were raised on the east coast mm-hmm. i'm going back a second yeah um you looked like you should have made in california tattooed on your forehead or something i know i used to go out in bars in boston before i even moved to california and they're like what part of california you're from i'm like <laughs> Dude, I'm from Plymouth, Mass, bro. <laughs> I just have to shed the accent because my mom still has a wicked Cape Cod accent. Yeah. It's gnarly. Um, did, had you gotten out of shape at all when they started shooting this doc? No. Can you still fit into the Speedos? I can. I can. I mean, I went through a, a rough stretch. Um, in August of 21, I was shooting a movie back east. I'll keep this short, but I, I ended up... And, and it was a, a buddy of mine's movie, and it was a Lifetime movie. I'm playing a cop. The whole thing is me talking, except about three-eighths of a page is action. And I chase a bad I have to hit a mark, see a bad guy in a hallway in a hospital, and then sprint after him. And it was one in the morning, and it was really humid, and I'm in these like, combat boots and police uniform. And we did it once, and everybody's like, cut, let's go home. We're all tired. And someone yells, oh, we're set up for it. Let's do it one more time. And we do it one more time. And I go to sprint and I ruptured my Achilles. And then cut to, I stayed because I was like, I just put a boot on and I owed him one more day. I was like, I'll just finish it. Cut to a year later, my foot is like loose. And it's it was not surgically repaired correctly. And I'm like, something's wrong. And I went and saw three specialists and... Two guys did not even want to like deal with it. They were just like, that's that's very complicated to go back in there. Multiple things could go wrong. One guy in Pasadena was like, yeah, unfortunately, the original surgeon did not do it correctly. It's too long and no amount of PT. There's nothing in the world you could do to, you know, to create that tensile strength again. So he does a shortening where you start the whole process over. They sever the Achilles and he cut out like that much. So it was it was that off, and then he reattaches. But then I had you're back on the couch, no weight for six, you know, on your leg at all for six weeks, and it, it that period of the the second surgery. Even though I was excited to hopefully have a a better foot, I just went into a darkness that I've never experienced in my life. Really? And yeah. It was it was. It was brutal because I've my entire life I, I grew up playing sports. My mom was like you're never going to be in trouble because I'm going to keep you so busy in sports. You won't have time to be in trouble. And I played football, wrestled and lacrosse all through high school. And then I played college football and lacrosse and, um, at, in college. And then fitness has always been, uh, just a, a way of my life, you know, and continue to al- always like trail running and surfing and lip weightlifting and yoga and all these things. And then, so for the first year of the Achilles, you know, I, I, you can't do anything for almost 
you know, three months, you can start using your upper body, you can, but it, it just, it feels, you know, you're just weak. And then, so I never even fully recovered. And then the second time you're starting all over again. So my body went through this horrible, um, just atrophy and then mentally not being able to get those endorphins that kind of keep me very mentally balanced and also just happy. Those are, that's my, my happy place, you know, especially being in the ocean and surfing is like one of the best things for me and it feeds my soul and I'm always like, and so that I couldn't do that for two years. And I just found myself in this place where I was, uh, I was just like, my soul was dead and um, I was zero fun to be around. I was unmotivated. Uh, I was just like, um, you know, trying to put on a good face for my family as much as I could, but they knew, like, even my, my daughter knew, but she was strong enough to, like, kind of fight through, and um, eventually it, it just, you know, I, I it, it took a long time, and then I just, by, by us uh, going back out to Malibu this, uh, we always go out in the, usually, the beginning of this summer because she starts her junior lifeguard program, but we had moved into this house that our friends gave up and it has, it's like a small L shaped ranch, but it has a big backyard and a pool. And um, so we put in an ice plunge and a sauna and all of a sudden I was like in nature all the time. I was ice plunging three times a day using a sauna. I was all of a sudden exercising and all these, and then these elements started to just trigger something. And I just like sparked. And like something inside of me just like did a complete 180. And like I went from like being during that dark period, I was like sleeping, sleeping late and not wanting like just it was everything was an effort. Like I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to do shit because I had done so much PT on the leg. And when you're doing Achilles PT, it's monotonous beyond belief. I mean, you're doing sitting here with a band over and over and over a thousand times heel raises and you, that's just for your foot. great shoes yeah and like you're you're not even doing the rest of your body so you at least have to spend an hour per day on just that and then if you have time try and exercise the rest of your body and it never feels like you're doing anything no like you're accomplishing no anything. it feels like i'm just going backwards so right luckily with this transition that happened um by you know, just logistically and being in nature all of a sudden and I started ocean swimming and I was just like, cause it's still not right. Um, but I've stopped, let, I stopped letting it consume my life. I'm like, life is, I finally realized like, Oh my God, I've, life is flying by. My daughter's growing up and I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not being a great influence because I'm not that fun to be around. So, and I, I knew that was happening in the time, in the moment, but when when the flip happened, I was like, "Whoa, I, I this is how it's supposed to be," you know. And and the weird thing is, I feel like even emotionally, spiritually, and physically, like better than before the injury, which is weird because I never would have guessed. Even though there's a, like a lot, and I have some nerve damage in my toes, but even though it still requires a lot of maintenance and work and I'm still grinding on it now really hard to try and get it back. Um, what I learned through that process and when you go through something like that, and I know you've been through some tough things in your life, but when you, when you're tested and you pull yourself out, you know, and I usually you, fail. <laughs> yeah. Well, I failed multiple times. They're not me. tests you can study for. <laughs> no, these are like, these are like life and death tests. Right. Um, but but when I when I kind of pulled myself out, you know, it was just it was basically me doing it too by tapping into what I what used to work and then realizing and it really started with like the cold plunging that started triggering something and I started to feel my spirit come back and then I just eventually snowballed and started like uh, like cold plunge sound on nutrition fitness exposure to sunlight, watching sunrise every every possible day I can. Like now I'm up at four in the morning just so I can like stretch, get everything done, 
And if I'm not driving my daughter to school, I take my dog to the beach and I make sure I'm down there for sunrise just because there's a really positive impact on our circadian rhythm by watching the sunrise. And it does all these amazing things for our bodies. Okay. Um, Wait a second. Yeah. I need to ask questions here. Okay, go. <laughs> what kind of dog? Okay. Well, his name's Trooper. Yeah, he's a year and a half rescue. He's, I'll show you a picture. Of that. He's, he's, he looks kind of like a cross between a German Shepherd, excuse me, <clears throat> German Shepherd, maybe a little rot, maybe a little hard to describe. He's, he's beautiful, but he was like kind of crazy. And, and I've always, I've been involved with Best Friends Animal Society for a long time, since 2000, and we've always rescued or adopted. And, um, but this one we kind of got pretty quickly because it's hard to find a young dog that doesn't have trauma. So you're, you're, we didn't want to adopt a one-year-old that already has this history. So he came up and, and we kind of, my daughter was like, oh my God, this is a dog. And then we find out he's got some, a little bit of, you know, he's very protective, but I, I, and I held a lot of, it was just frustrating dealing with them until I got him one of those e collars, mm -hmm. and then now I, I use that, and it's like now I've, I, I love the dog because it's not like before I take him to the beach, he'd eat a lobster shell right in front of me. I couldn't catch him, and I'm like, dude, you're gonna die, and I'm not even gonna feel bad because we've only had you for this long, and you're suicidal, and he's eating seaweed, and he's barking at people and scaring them, and now with the with the collar, I just click it, call his name, and he recalls and stops the behavior, and. It just makes it way better, and, and um, it's a much better routine. And Rescues are the best. Oh, the, I have two right now. Do you? Yes, yeah. I do. Buddy and Sophie. Nice. Um, you clearly were influenced uh, by your mother. Yes. What about your father? I hope I'm not going somewhere I shouldn't. No, no, no. My dad has been passed away. I hope I don't get this wrong. Probably 16 years. Oh, my. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, he was 11 years older than my mom. Uh, very interesting story, um, which most people, people don't know. He was born in Baghdad, Iraq, uh, which you would never guess by looking at me. But um, he was... The name a little. Yeah, Chokichi. Yeah, exactly. Um and uh, he was light skinned, blue eyes, uh, which is rare over there. So visually and physically, he did not fit in. So all of a sudden they're like, you know, it, and it, when he was growing up there, it was a very different time. And when you don't visually fit in, they think something's off here as a, like the, the culture. And this is with Saddam and his sons running the show. Um, and my dad had a voice on him and he was very outspoken against Saddam and the whole regime. And to the point where he ended up like in jail for a night, his dad got him out and his dad basically said, it, you cannot be doing this shit. They're going to come and grab you in the middle of the night. It's called, they just, they call it disappearing you. The, we won't even know. And we'll never see you again. We'll never know what happened to you. And you're literally, you're not safe here. We have to get you like out of here. You've, you've, like you're on their list. So his dad somehow scrounged up, they came from dirt and his dad scrounged up enough money to put him on a boat. He immigrated through Ellis Island. Um, he wanted to become a doctor. He had very small connections in the United States, but managed to put himself through medical school. Um, long story short, ended up working at Boston University uh, met my mom at, he was doing his internship at Wellesley College and she was in nursing school and ended up becoming an um, emergency room doctor in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where I grew up and became, eventually became chief of surgery down at that hospital and total success story. Oh, um, amazing dad, but you know, he, he did not know how to relate to us as kids. His idea of, of, um, relating to us was okay, boys. You know, there's work to be done around the yard, and this would be, you know, when we're like in between like eighth grade and grad in high school. Like, you know, we want to go to the beach with our buddies or go water skiing or do something. And he's like, "You boys aren't going anywhere. There's work to be done," and, that, and that's how it is. And we're so fucking mad. My brother and I would be like, "Well, what is it? Just to give us a list." He's like, "No, no, no." start by doing this, weed the garden, and it'd be on and on and on until like four o'clock. And sometimes buddies would come over and help for an hour and they're like, dude, we're out of here. This isn't, you know, you guys are stuck. 
But in the end, you know what? It taught us work ethic. And we, myself, my brother, and my sister have like gnarly work ethic. Like I can outwork most people. I also like I have a carpentry background and I work construction um, for a long time. And I, I just could outwork guys. And they're like, holy shit, dude. Like, so he, he taught us a lot of things. Um, they were kind of unspoken things and they weren't, they weren't the kind of like, tender and you're like hey yeah come on son i love you kind of things but you know they were they were lessons uh and, and they paid off in life and um you know he was an amazing he was the kind of doctor he, like when he had office hours there'd be a line of people in his office because he would sit in there and want to know their story or really what's going on with them like he didn't he didn't rush people out of there. He was in there for, he's really to help them with their medicine or whatever you could do, but also to talk to them and like get to know them. And, um, and his patients loved him. And that it was, it was cool. David, I noticed you have a tattoo. I don't remember seeing that in, this, this, in Baywatch. No, this one was new. This one was weird. This one came from my subconscious. So it's, it's random, Steve. All right. So, for like a year, I was driving my daughter to school. They have those Crayola markers that you draw on windows. These markers are really good for kind of like experimenting with like drawings on your arms. And then I took it into this tattoo artist and he was like, I'm not sure. And then he ended up doing it. And I just was like, I, he's like, I think I got it. And he went with it. But anyway, if you look at it from this angle, it, you know, you, if you cut it off there, it looks kind of like roots into the ground. Mm -hmm. If you flip it the other way, it looks like a tree growing up right and then also from my angle from my pov it's like an estuary where an ocean meets a river meets kind of land when you see those beautiful like estuaries in the amazon right so it was a very weird thing because it was nothing i had visually seen but it kept coming up in my subconscious and i kept drawing it and i just went with it and then i just like anytime i um, I have time. I kind of just like, it's almost a form of like meditation or mindfulness. You know what I mean? I can just use it like that. Wow. We'll be back in a moment. You were on People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People. It's weird. It's like being a part of that 50 Most Beautiful issue follows you around like a calling card. Like it opens doors. Who were you closest with on the cast? In the cast, um, probably Alexander Paul and Jason Simmons and Jeremy Jackson. Um, you know, when when Jeremy went through, a, I'm sure you know, a pretty rough phase in his life, and he had reached out for some help, and he was actually in prison. And um, Alexander called me, and she was like did you hear what happened? And, and Jeremy was in the, like the, I think they call them the twin towers downtown. Which, oh yeah. Yeah. Which is not a good place to be. Um, but she's just like, do you want to go visit him and, and give him some, I was like, absolutely. Hell yes. Let's go. And, uh, we, we went down and visited him and, um, when they brought him in and we're sitting across from the glass and he's in his jumpsuit and, uh, you know, he started crying and we were like crying, like just, it, it was just really hard to see um, because the kid, uh, and he's completely turned his life around. Uh, he's become uh, basically a guru, like to really helping people. He does these men's retreats. He offers free breathwork classes. Um, he's sober. He's super fit. He's all into fitness and nutrition. And uh, I'm really, and just, speaks from like his heart there's no filter on him and it's it's really beautiful to see but um to see in that him in that setting man i was like my my heart just was like almost broken it was just like because you could you could see he was like he was petrified and he had no idea Who what was wouldn't be yeah that's not a good place to be but. um there was talk about them doing a reboot yes yeah and there still is so it's a very strange situation um CBS was going to do a reboot right before the Dwayne Johnson and Zac Efron movie came out. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be Baywatch or Magnum P.I. And they were leaning towards Baywatch. And I was really close to it. Um, and I even went on locations to go with them. And then the movie came out and the movie 
was kind of funny, I guess, but it did nothing for Baywatch except hurt the brand. Um, because they could have been, they could have been astronauts. They could have been anything. They, it had nothing to do with lifeguarding. It was just like, um, uh, it just didn't make sense. Um, so CBS was like, we can't, nobody's going to tell, everybody was like, we can't touch this thing for two years. And I'm, I'm in touch with this one producer, one of the creators, Greg Bonan. And I've always, for 10 years, I've been like, why aren't you guys rebooting it? Because once that phase started, every show from the 90s that rebooted worked. And I'm like, and then this happened. And then they, there was a big, they were like, we can't do anything now for two years. And then now they had, you know, they realized, I think during COVID and then increasingly after COVID, internationally, people started watching Baywatch again. And Fremantle, who owns the comp or owns the, the Baywatch rights, noticed this huge uptick in international viewing around the world. So they basically triggered this idea to, you know, okay, let's move forward with a reboot. And it ended up at Fox. Um, the problem with that is Fox already has a lifeguarding show that John Wells developed called High Rescue um, that's already in production and it's shooting on the North Shore of Hawaii and they're, they're putting a lot of money into it. It's gonna, I think it's gonna premiere after the Super Bowl. Um, so I, I even asked Greg, I'm like, is this, is this like death to the, the, the reboot? Or is, he's like, ah, it could be, it could be really good. Or it could be really bad. Who knows? But, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if Fox is, if a network's really going to run two lifeguarding shows. Um, and it seems like John Wells has been pretty outspoken that he doesn't want his show to be compared to, to Baywatch. But unfortunately he's doing a show about lifeguarding and, uh, you know, we were doing it. You set the standard. Yeah, come on, dude. <laughs> um, are you worried at all about the time that's passing? I mean, you look fantastic. You haven't aged a second. <laughs> uh, but Hollywood is a weird place when it comes to being a little long in the tooth. It is, but you know, I um, I I get a lot of my happiness from outside of work, you know, and I think that's really important. I, I don't. When I was younger, I used to really chase it, and I was re very tied to it, and it will probably to so much to the point that it wasn't healthy. So, if I auditioned for something and I, I was close and it went well and I didn't get it, I'd be you know I'd be you know very like it, it wouldn't derail me. But now it's like I just don't give a fuck, man. There's at the end of the day, I'd my goal is to get on another series because. On a series, you have not only do you have kind of guaranteed work, but you're working with the same actors. Your work inevitably becomes better because you get into a rhythm of, okay, this is, you know, you're doing this for six or eight months and you, you're, you have that time to really grow as a, as a crew and a cast. Whereas a movie, you know, it's whatever, it's two weeks, three weeks, a couple months, whatever. It's in and out and you don't have that, that time to kind of, Gross. So that's my 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 kind of my wish. And and I I even for the Baywatch reboot, I'm like I would go back and do it. And I wrote this cool story arc of where my character's been, how you could bring him back, and they're like they love it. But there's a new showrunner who's running it, and she has creative control, so it's like up to her, you know. So we'll see. But I I don't um you know I'm do you I'm, think I'm, Baywatch hindered your career at all? I think. You know, initially when it hindered all of our careers, because when I tried to audition for things while I was in, during hiatuses and a lot back in the day, remember there were like movie of the weeks that they would pump out or whatever it was. After they were, school specials. Yeah, they were just there was a certain stigma against all of us and they didn't they didn't even care. They didn't see your tape. They don't even know you, but if they just saw that you were in the cast of Baywatch, they'd either say no, you're not, we're not bringing in that actor because nobody on Baywatch can act, or if you went in, it was like double the pressure because now they know you're on Baywatch and they're looking for one slip up or one moment of oh he doesn't get it to just go ahead and, and reaffirm their bias, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you had to go in so prepared. 
and not fall into the trap of feeling pressured, even though you are, because you you're it's a very awkward situation. Um, and it was just an unfair bias because I always and I continue to say we were shooting a, a medium of entertainment. It, we never said we were doing Shakespeare on the beach. We were doing Baywatch. And it was. I like that. Maybe they should make them. You know, a show about that Shakespeare on the beach. And it's like, you you could stick an a, an an Oscar winning actor into any of our roles with the lines and the situation, and it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be Baywatch, and, you, and they're going to get the same feedback as we were getting. You know, it's just it it wasn't us. It was just the and, and but I was happy to represent because it was like you know what, we entertained billions of people around the world. And also our names became recognizable around the world. And a lot of the financing that comes from movies or future television shows comes from your worldwide name recognition. And at one time it was the yeah biggest show in the world, the most watched TV show in the world. I'm, we're in the Guinness Book of World Records and I have the, and it's a cast photo that I'm in and I'm like, you know, it's yes. badass, dude. Um, so it, it it did for a while, but I, I persevered and I ended up getting another series called Witchblade, which was an amazing TV show that was probably the best written thing I've ever done that we shot in Toronto based on a comic book. Um, this guy, Ralph Hemmaker, was the showrunner and writer, director, unreal, unreal TV show. Um, I ended up getting another TV series called Beyond the Break that was, um, I played a, um, a surf coach that we shot in Hawaii of a female surf team which was super fun um on on oahu on the west side of makaha um and i'm still working i'm I'm about to start a movie with uh this director who's 72 and has just overcome a gnarly surgical error and regained his health and we're about to restart on the 23rd we're in rehearsing this week and it's called married alive it's a really cool script probably the better best one he's written another friend of mine's doing a movie called um daddy issues it's like a female version of swingers and i'm doing kind of this really funny cameo on tuesday for her movie and um you know so it's like i've I've just like once I've, I've switched gears when I kind of came out of that whole thing and I've like opened myself back up to the universe and been more like just way more engaged in life in general and and everything like things started to fall in place and um, I'm I'm producing with this guy for this movie Married Alive and I helped because he he was ready to throw in the towel he was so frustrated because a couple of the actors were were just not committing and a couple of the crew guys were kind of like, you know, they weren't committing. And I, I talked him off the ledge and I'm like, dude, you, you, you survived this gnarly situation because you were meant to direct this script, this movie. And, and, and here we are, we're like, and now he's got more vigor and more excitement about life than I've ever seen. And he's so fired up. So, yeah. Uh, what was the scariest thing that ever happened on the show? On uh, Baywatch, yeah, man, that probably. So we, the uh, probably this, we had to do. Uh, they brought over these Australians, okay? <laughs> Who are these? They're called uh, the Uncle Toby's. Is like a, it's kind of like a circuit of lifeguard racing that they do in Australia. It's like the best, and, and Australian lifeguards are the best in the world. They're badass beyond belief i mean they're like legendary for everything they do so we had this storyline where they come over and one of them happened to used to date pam back in the day and they brought over like the best and the most charismatic guys um to do this episode um where we kind of i butt heads with one of them but we kind of compete against each other throughout the show and one of one part of the episode was they decide okay we're going to do a night swim with these australians and chokachi and it was at Huntington Pier, and it was at night, and the water was freezing, and the surf was huge. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, just put some Vaseline under your armpits and your groin. It'll keep the heat in. That's the trick. And and all the Aussies, they don't give a shit, dude. They, they do not give a shit. So when you're – and this happens in real life. When you're doing any kind of lifeguard racing, it's it's very aggressive. It's – they – 
it's kind of water polo technique. They'll pull your leg, they'll swim over the top of you, they'll push your head down, they'll do anything and kind of to, to get by you and also to like kind of leave you in the dust. And even though we're shooting this and they know I'm like the star of the show, these guys were literally trying to kill me and drown me. <laughs> and I just remember I'm like, I, I don't even know if I can make it out to this buoy at the end of this pier and back in through the surf. Like, I mean, it, it was it was the real deal. That, that, that was probably the hardest thing I had to do. The rest was gravy, man. All the action stuff was so fun. I, I crushed that stuff. And we'll be right back. Is there anything you miss about the Baywatch days? Yeah, man. It's, uh, you know, going working on the beach, uh, reflecting back, it's, I mean, granted, the writing was the writing, right? And some episodes were better than others. Some were not good. And I, I never am one to talk shit about that show. A lot of the actors love to rip it. I do not rip it. I think it's, it's the best thing. It was I was made for that show, and I loved every minute of it. Um, but I miss I miss going like showing up there early in the morning and um, being on the beach, being especially the part where we are, we had two units: a first unit, which was all the dialogue and the scene work, and second unit was all the action and the montages, like the the slow mo running. <laughs> Um, and the, and the second unit was always like a fun day. You knew you were going to be, it was a day of like, you're going to exercise all day, whether it's like, you know, they would be running or training or ocean swimming, or it'd be like a Pamela and I montage of just like running on the beach, her, her like kind of training me, um, us like shooting hoops, us making out. <laughs> uh, but those days, and then also like, Second unit meant like a lot of days would go over to Catalina and shoot a lot of scuba diving stuff, um, which was so fun or driving the speed boats or the jet skis. So th that stuff like was I, I was just like in heaven. You were on People magazine's 50 most beautiful people. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? That was cool, man. I was, uh, you know, I don't know if it's still a big deal today. I think it is. But back then it was like a huge deal. And um I was so stoked to be a part of it. Um, the shoot was really fun. I forget the photographer's name, but we actually we shot it out in Malibu, and it was it was like Tom Cruise was on the cover, and I had this great photo on the inside, and um, and it's it's weird. It's like being a part of that fifty most beautiful issue follows you around like a calling card. Like it opens doors. Like it would, it would get me into like restaurants when they said like there's no sorry we have no tables available or sorry we can't let you into this place because you know the lines it, it's insane and to this day um you know it people reference it almost in every interview and it's like so it, it's a cool thing i mean i i don't tote it around like oh my god I like the beautiful people in the world but being a part of it you know it's definitely uh, it was it was a neat thing what's the weirdest thing a fan you must get swarmed still by fans, maybe not to the degree you did when the show was on, but what's the weirdest thing a fan has ever asked you for? For the most part, it's always been very positive, like really positive. Like I just got something, it went, they went to Surfrider Foundation because they do a lot with them, but it was from someone in Slovakia, like, and they, they're so happy to like be able to, like they found an address where they could contact me and they put their own postage on it. And I love responding to those people because you know, Eastern European countries are, you know, they they don't have a lot to, it's, especially wintertime, it's dark, it's gloomy, um, it's it's crazy. Uh, like two Fourth of Julys ago, I was sitting next to this woman, this beautiful Russian woman, and I was just talking with her, and I end up talking to her, she's like, she's like, you're, I don't know if I should say this, but you're Cody from Baywatch, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, 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 how do you know? And she's like, well, I used to watch you. And I was like, well, where did you grow up? She's like, I grew up in Siberia. I'm like, well, what, like, what, what part is this Siberia? You're big in Siberia. Describe this to me. She goes, picture your most remote town in the coldest, darkest place in the world, and that's where I grew up. And we were obsessed with Baywatch. And now she's like a hugely successful photographer in L.A. and a new mom and everything. But... It, the, the reach that Baywatch has, like globally, 
is shocking. I mean, absolutely mind blowing. One more story, like uh, last year, um, my in-laws, my wife's parents, we took us to the Galapagos on a National Geographic, uh, cool. one of the sh one of the boats, and there's um, naturalists and guides who are on the ship with you, and it's such a great experience. Like a being in the Galapagos and being with these guides who are so knowledgeable, uh, it feels like you're going back in time. Like things are untouched. The animals are they're absolutely unafraid of you because they're not. There's no human pressure on them. Their their only pressure is from natural predators. Uh, so we're we're down there and we're going ashore one day and the guy has a red rescue can, and I'm like, I'm asking him like, hey man, what's the what what what's for the red rescue can? He's like, oh, we call it Pamela. I'm like, no way, dude. And I end up telling him, I'm like, you know, I was on Baywatch. And he's like, wait, what? I thought I might have known you. And then so we went out, like, started talking about it. I posted it on my Instagram. But so there's a picture of us in the Galapagos. Like, they literally call their red rescue buoys anytime they go ashore, Pamela. Um, and there's this great picture of me and the guides with, like, the red rescue buoy. And um, so the global reach and I've experienced in other really remote parts of the world was, is un, it's like unfathomable. It's just really wild. I don't think there's, I don't think there's another show or a movie or that in the history of TV and film that has penetrated places that are so remote and, and been successful. It's just, it's mind blowing. David, we're out of time. What? Come on, I got so much more to tell you. I'm man. sure you do. <laughs> you are a good talker. Thank you. This was awesome. I had a good time too. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you came. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck with whatever comes next. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer. Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>